chapter 5, if you would please, Galatians chapter 5, we're going to look at something I consider to be very interesting. I've already half preached this to the family last night, so hopefully they find it interesting. But we're going to be in this for a little while, I'm, I wouldn't say weeks and weeks, but just more than one or two services, certainly, as we consider the next of the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 22 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. Father, I pray that you'd help us today, that you speak to our hearts through your word. Help us to apply what you say to us, to our lives. May we ever be people that love truth and light and prove so through our lives. Help us, we pray, for only you indeed can help us. We cannot help ourselves. Thank you, Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we looked at number five last week of the fruit of the Spirit, which is gentleness. And if you remember, the basic definition of gentleness is uh, integrity on one hand, right, moral goodness, and then on the other hand, kindness, kindness. So just a very brief reminder there. Because number six is very similar to gentleness, it is called goodness, as you see there in your Bible. Goodness. Goodness means this, according to Mr. Thayer, uprightness of heart and life, well, that sounds a lot like integrity, doesn't it? Uprightness of heart and life. Goodness or kindness. So what does gentleness mean? Gentleness means kindness. What does goodness means mean? Goodness also means kindness. So you may say, like I did yesterday, sitting down to study for this, okay, there's got to be a difference because they're two different Greek words. What's the difference? And wouldn't you know that um, it's not something easily gotten, but something that does exist. <laughs> Thankful for that. God makes sure that we know what he wants us to know of these. So two different words, and we're going to get a little bit into the Greek here to begin with, whether that interests you or not. I hope it does. I know no one's here a Greek. No one here is a Greek scholar, and I'm not a Greek scholar either. But the Bible was written in the New Testament in Greek, and we have to deal with the Greek at times, and deal with it honestly. Or else we end up with things like, well, gentleness means kindness, and goodness means kindness. So let's just be doubly kind. No, that's not being honest with it. We have to look at the nuances. Nuances. So two different Greek words. The first is Christetes. The second is agathosene. Agathosene. That's a fun word. And Christetes. Okay. So two different words. We know that things that are different are not the same. I hope that's something that you carry with you the rest of your life is an understanding that things that are different are not the same. That's why we don't use any Bible translation in the church. That's why I don't look and say, just use whatever you want and it'll be fine because things are different, not the same. So we settle on the King James for very good reasons. Different Greek words mean different things. That's why you have three different types or four, depending on what you're studying, types of love in the Bible, even though it all says love. Four different nuances. So, Christetes and Agathosine. Very important to remember that. You say, what is Christetes? Christetes is the gentleness. It is the first. And it is kindness or being good as far as being sweet and kind and mellow. That's the nuance. There's nothing rough about gentleness and it kind of makes sense or that form of kindness there's nothing rough about that 
It's just soft and gentle. I mean, you think of fluffy clouds, you think of pretty rainbows, you think of cotton candy. It's just sweet. There's nothing rough or harsh about it at all. When we studied it last week, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, my burden that is light, my yoke is easy. Remember we said the yoke of Christ is kind. Well, there's nothing harsh about the yoke of Christ. Everything he has for us, now it may not feel light and fluffy all the time, but nothing that he has for us with this yoke is harsh. It's as mellow and kind and sweet as you can be. And just apply that little nuance to that. It gives you a whole different light, doesn't it? The yoke of Christ. He's not some slave driver. He's being kind to us. Being nice. Right? Romans 3.12. Remember, there's no, none good, no, not one. None good, no, not one. We talked about that. The fact that we are not good. There's none that are morally good. None that have integrity in this world. No, this world's not kind, is it? This world's not fluffy and rainbows. And If people are like that, they have generally some underlying reason for it. Something that they can get out of it. Now, there's a lot of harshness about this world. Galatians 5.22, of course, with the fruit of the Spirit being gentleness, we have to learn to be kind, to be mellow. That's not very hard for a lot of ladies. That's hard for a lot of men. Even on both sides, there's some that are more driven to mellowness and kindness than others for reasons. But our flesh generally does want to be harsh, rough, rash. Right? And we as believers have to learn to speak appropriately, act appropriately. You know, we tie all this into so many things, so many things. We've talked about it with Ephesians 5 where it says we should speak appropriately. Ephesians 4, we should be kind to one another. Again, that's the same word. Be kind, mellow, sweet. But, but we have this other word, <laughs> this agathus. Let me see if I can. Agathosune. I forget these things, so I have to phonetically put it out. Agathosune. That balances out this Christetes. We talk about John 1.14, Jesus, a perfect balance of grace and truth. If we're all about sweet and kindness and mellowness, then we become unbalanced if we have no agathosune, no goodness about our life. So this agathosune is this kindness or being good that includes having a zeal for goodness and truth, meaning it can include rebuking, correcting, and chastening. That's a balance, isn't it? Because rebuking, correcting, and chastening is not very mellow, is it? And yet we see both in Christ, both in God. And we must have both in our lives, lest we become unbalanced with either. So we understand this Christetes, this kindness, this mellowness, is more passive. While this agathosune, the zeal for goodness and truth, but also kindness and goodness, is more active. So in order to exhibit both types of kindness correctly, we have to be, as with anything else, as with love, joy, peace, long-suffering, we have to be bound by the word of God, lest we go beyond our bounds, right? I mean, 
you talk about having a zeal for goodness and truth, rebuking, correcting, and chastening. I mean, it, you, it's not too far of a stretch to say, well, we can go about the world like the Crusaders did back in the days of the Crusades, those Catholics, and try to make the world a better place. Make the world believe in Jesus. No, we have to be bound by the word of God because God's word gives us our boundaries. You say, well, why do I see so much of what's going on on both ends? We see a lot of mellowness and no real love for truth. And on the other end, we see a great love for truth and no real mellowness and people on both ends going beyond their bounds, going into politics, going into whatever, very harsh, very brash behavior. It's because people refuse to be bound by the word of God. They refuse the faith that they proclaim. And we can't be people that do that. We have to be bound by this book. If we're to be a people of this book, it means we live by this book and we're bound by it. So we must be bound by the word of God and filled with the spirit or else we can quickly find ourselves off balance. For example, some want only the former and not the latter. Some people just want to be sweet, kind, mellow. You know, I just want to get along with everyone. Why can't we just be people pleasers? And why can't we just be kind and mellow? And I've known plenty of people throughout my life just like that. And they don't want the zeal for goodness and truth. They don't want the rebuking, correcting, and chastening. They don't want to speak up and do what's right because it is right. And so they become off balance. Too much sweetness. Too much sweetness can make you sick, can it? Can make you sick. The Bible even says that. Don't eat too much honey or else you'll throw it up. But there's also the other. Others only want the latter. They're, they're filled with the flesh. Now both are filled with the flesh if they want just sweetness and not truth. You're filled with the flesh as far as you just want to be kind and passive. Kind and mellow, just like you know the hippies back in the 60s. Just, ah, everybody get along. Well, that, that's, that's not the flesh. That's not the flesh. And so that's... As far as you can be full of the flesh in that way and also be full of the flesh as far as just wanting to fight everybody <laughs> and wanting to stand for the truth. Um, even many times in situations that we have no business addressing, going beyond our bounds, chastening people that we have no business chastening, correcting people we have no business correcting, rebuking people we have no business rebuking. There's time for that, which is why we talk about balance. But there's people that they just only want that. No sweetness. No sweetness. No mellowness. So they want too much harshness. They're in the flesh as far as that. Christian walk is all about balance, isn't it? All about balance. If you write anything down today, I hope you write that down. It's all about balance. You're going to struggle just like I do. You're going to struggle all your life to find it. Because maybe you're one prone to harshness and you have to struggle to be sweet, kind, and mellow. Or maybe you're prone to sweet, kind, and mellowness and you have to work to Stand for truth. Do what's right because it's right. There's a balance and God helps us to fulfill that balance. Just as Jesus was that perfect balance. So we're going to look at the examples of Christ with us. And I'll say again, Christ was the perfect balance of grace and truth. John 1.14 says so. He was full of grace and truth. He didn't have a sin nature to fight with, though. We have to work our whole lives to meet this balance. Jesus didn't. He didn't. He was God made flesh, did not have a sin nature, did everything perfectly, and so he did. 
And so he was very embodiment of goodness, wasn't he? A very embodiment of all the fruit of the Spirit. He bore all the fruit of the Spirit perfectly. He was always filled with the Spirit of God, always did the will of his Father. But while many accolade the Lord for his healing and benevolence, or his Christites, Christ showed his gentleness, his Christites, let the little children come unto me, right? Oh, don't make those people go and go back to the city for the food. Let's give them the food right here. Christites, kindness, sweetness, healed many people, didn't he? People love that side of Jesus. They love that side of Jesus. But they conveniently ignore his zeal for truth and his harshness while also being kind. Think about that. See, we, we've been so, so indoctrinated in our society. Society has so taught us over the years that you can't teach people what's right. You can't rebuke and be kind. Oh, yes, you can. The Bible very clearly says that if we ought to do what's right and say what's right, if it's our position to do so and we don't do it, then we just are showing hatred to people. We're not showing love, certainly. People conveniently ignore Christ's zeal for truth and harshness, harshness his agathosune. Say, harshness out of Jesus? Yeah, what, what do you find in Matthew 23, which we're going to look at, not today? Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, he says repeatedly. I mean, what do you think he was when he cleansed the temple? Twice overturning tables, scourging people as he cleaned out his father's house. Do you think that was sweetness? Oh, it was kindness of a sort that is only of a godly sort. But yes, harshness, harshness. People like to ignore that Jesus. To be an honest Christian, neither of these can be ignored and both must be sought after. You say, I need to cleanse the temple? No, no. But we need to have a love for what's right. And if we're put in a position to do what's right or speak up for what's right, then we ought not be ashamed to do so. We need that balance in our lives. Because there are plenty of times that we should keep our mouths shut and do nothing. And there are plenty of times when we should open our mouths and do something. It depends on the situation and the boundaries God has given us in his word. So the examples of Christ, first we're going to look at cleansing the temple. That's all we're going to look at today. It's all the further we're going to get. Christ cleansed the temple. You see this in, I believe, every gospel record. But we understand as we go through the gospel records, and we're not going to look at all of them. We'll look at at least John chapter 2. You do have it at the beginning of Christ's ministry, and you have it at the end. Very interesting. He did it twice. Did it twice. John chapter 2 at the beginning, and then Matthew 21 at the end, right after his triumphal entry. So this here, the cleansing of the temple, it's a set of circumstances unique to Christ. Unique to Christ. Meaning we never see him instructing the church to do such a thing. Or the church doing it. It's not our job to fix people religiously, spiritually. Only Jesus does that. Only he had the right to do this. We don't. It's not my job to go into the Catholic Church 
and to fix the Catholic Church and cast down their idols and say, this is a place of heresy and on and on and on. It's not my job to go into the Baptist churches that have things wrong and to fix what I think is wrong. It's not my job. It's not my job. I say that because over history, people have thought that it is their job, and it's not. We never see him instructing the church to do such a thing or the church doing it. Christ had the unique right to do this as the Son of God and obviously did this in accordance with God's will while filled with the Spirit. This is his goodness coming forth, this agathusine, agathosune, as we've uh, said, this is this goodness, this zeal, this love for truth and light. We consider this here in a few ways. One, we see Satan's desires. And Satan certainly had his way over decades with Judaism as it became. And what happened, what happened was um, he corrupted Judaism. Whereas Judaism was a religion that God gave to his people to point to the coming Messiah. And men, because of the lust of their flesh, just like they have today, they corrupted it so that they could get what they wanted out of it. We see in John chapter 2, verse 13, the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. So Satan desires one to deaden our worship. He desires to deaden our worship. This is something we have to guard ourselves against. I have to guard as an entire church. We have to guard as people walking with God individually because Satan wants to deaden our worship. What is worship? Well, we see in John 4, 24 that Worship is uh, worshiping God in spirit and in truth. It can be very summarized, concisely summarized, as obeying the word of God. That is worship. It's not dancing around and singing songs and getting all emotional. It is simply obeying the word of God. If you determine to listen to God's word, apply it to your life, with God helping you, you're worshiping God. That means we do it here as we seek to do things God's way, but more importantly, we do it throughout the week as we seek to live for Christ, applying his word to our lives. That is true worship. That is what God seeks. With Judaism, with the law that God gave, the Passover, which is mentioned here in verse 13, the Passover if you don't know, it was a special time for the Jews. It's outlined in Exodus 12, verse 1 through 28, which we'll not go to this morning. But it was a special time for the Jews that would remind them of God's delivering them from Egypt. That God sent Moses, that God brought the plagues upon Egypt, that God killed the firstborn of every individual in Egypt that did not have the lamb's blood over the doorpost. And he did it to deliver his people. He did it also to give them a clear picture of Christ, that Passover lamb. So many pictures of Christ in that lamb. And 1 Corinthians 5 and verse number 7 even calls Christ our Passover. It is Christ the Passover lamb that died for us, shed his blood, became sin for us who knew no sin, did nothing to deserve that sacrifice, but gave himself willingly to substitute himself for us. Christ, our Passover. And what happened? But the Jews deadened the worship. More specifically, the Pharisees, the priests, the scribes, the leadership deadened the worship to, to uh, profit themselves, and the people just went along with it. They said, all right, and they became used to it. Their consciences became seared over time. Their children just understood that this is the way things were done. 
And so what was to be a special time, just like many church services, what was to be a special time became that. Eh, it's just something we do. You know, many church services to be a special time that we come together as God's children. We come together to sing the Bible to God. We come together to give to God. We come together to give not just of our goods, but our hearts to God. We come together to learn of God's word together, to encourage one another, to pray for one another. But what does it become so many times? Just that. It's something we do every week. It's something we do every week. Or it's some production that has to be put on to keep the people's attention and interest. Just like it's TV shows and the movies and what have you. Satan desires to deaden our worship. When you and I come together after a week of watching God work in our lives, after a week of being in our Bibles and studying it day by day, and God teaching our hearts, we come together and we say, God, I want something from you for today. I can't wait to talk about you today with everyone else and how you worked in my life and are working in my life. I can't wait to see my brothers and sisters in Christ as we're seeking Christ together. That's the way church is supposed to be. But Satan has deadened so many, has he? So much so that the children even have come to understand, yeah, that's the way things are. Just some dead thing. That's why so many churches, you imagine, have these youth groups that's just a party all the time during church, a party with candy, a party with games, a party with fun little kid songs. And then they come and sit in the church service and there's none of that, or maybe there is. But if there's none of that, they say, where's the party? Where's the party? And you wonder why, you wonder why the kids don't go to church. They've never been taught to have that thriving relationship with the God of heaven. They just want the party. They want that thing that feeds their flesh. And when they can't have it, they go find it somewhere else. And there's plenty of it even outside of churches today. Plenty of it. Satan desires to deaden our worship. And then he desires also to change our emphasis. Verse 14, what's the emphasis in the temple? Making money. Making money. When the worship is deadened, our emphasis changes. It ceases to be Christ. And it becomes something else. Here it's money. Plenty of other places... It's money, too. Other places, it's other things. Generally, it becomes money, people, you know. It's the pastor's little empire or what have you. But he's making money, you know. When the worship is dead and our emphasis changes because the focus is not on obeying the word, the focus is not on Christ. It's on something else. And that's what made Jesus mad. And you can imagine, folks, you can imagine it makes God mad today, too. So we look at Christ's zeal. Secondly, the first was Satan's desires, then we have Christ's zeal. Imagine, if you will, we can't really understand this, but imagine if your God made flesh and you come to the temple, and Jesus had been to the temple before, but this time he comes to the temple, he watches the creation worship themselves, basically is what it amounts to when you're just focused on making money like this. You're focused on cheating people. You're focused on, instead of saying, well, oh, you need, you need change for your money. You need to swap your money out. Well, we'll, we'll impose a little tax on you to make a little for ourselves. Or we'll just... Um, 
make sure you have the exact change instead of saying, well, why don't you just round up <laughs> or round down or whatever you need to do. He watched the creation worship themselves in a place dedicated to worship God. Can you imagine all the places around here? Even the heretics and the cultists that we call them, and rightly so, that preach a false doctrine, every single one of them. I don't know of one that wouldn't say, oh, this is a building dedicated to God. But nothing or little godly happens there. It's just the creation worshiping themselves in God's name. Can you imagine how mad that would make Jesus? Imagine how he feels about it today. So look at his actions here. It says that when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep, the oxen, and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the table. So his actions were he saw the covetous business of the temple he saw the seared hearts of the people that were used to it. And by the way, folks, I've been there too. Sarah and I, we went to college and we uh, sat there for eight years. Oh, we're going to have a Bible conference, but you have to pay $100 to get all the messages. Well, I, know, I know technology wasn't as advanced as it is today, but I I also know it didn't cost $100 to make cassette tapes. I know it didn't cost $100 to print something off a printer and put it in an envelope or whatever the case was for those cassette tapes. And yes, I'm that old. And the kids look and say, what are cassette tapes? They did eventually go to CDs, but it was still, yeah, $100. And people, people had no problem. And we even, I think my wife did, if, if not me, we, we were poor college students, but we were so under that influence that we just thought nothing about, here's $100. Here's $100. You get used to it. Oh, we need you to take up a special offering because we need to do X, Y, Z that doesn't really need done around here or doesn't really need bought. But I feel that God has put it on my heart to do this, and so we need to do it, and you need to give more. That's a summary. <laughs> but how many times have I heard it in my life? How many times have you heard it? Maybe never. If you've never heard that, we'll praise the Lord for it. Sarah and I have heard it plenty of times. People get used to it. And you don't question it. You don't say a thing about it. That's the day Jesus walked into also. The people are used to this sort of thing. Can you imagine how it grieved his heart and how it grieves his heart today to watch such things occur? I'm just talking about my personal experience, not to talk about the uh, televangelists that constantly beg for your money and to rob you of what you need to live on and the uh, parachurch ministries that pluck on your heartstrings or not even part of a local church. They want to take out of your tithe and they want to take away from the local church and out of your earning and living so that they can survive and how many times have i seen well we've prayed so much and we believe god would have this ministry to exist but we need your help well if god wants it to exist god will make sure it exists without your help and mine double standards double speak people have you can imagine he's not happy with it he was so unhappy, yet out of his goodness he did this. Remember, he made a scourge of small cords and drove them all out of the temple. And the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables. That's his actions. He drove them out. He said, no. 
Now the sad, sad thing is they didn't get the hint because he did it again at the end of his ministry. <laughs> Same thing. Same thing. Maybe they said, oh, here's this guy coming again. <laughs> but same thing. Can you imagine? We live in that day also. But look at his speech, not just his actions. What did he have to say about it? He said unto them in verse number 16, said unto them that sold doves, take these things hence. Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. So he said that the temple was his father's house. He said this also in Matthew 21. My father's house. What is this church building? It is God's. It is not ours. It is not mine. It is not yours. It's God's. It's for God's use. We've had to, over the years, tell people no about certain things. Can I get married here? Well, are you a member here? No, then no, I'm sorry. Can we have a gospel music concert here for a, for a fundraiser? No, that's not what the church building is for. Oh, you might have a good time. You might raise a lot of money, but this is God's house. It's not for fundraisers making money. I mean, well, what do you think? <laughs> what do you think's happening right here in this passage? Someone wanted to have yoga here in the gymnasiums. No, I'm sorry. Girl Scouts wanted to have their cookies distributed here. No, I'm sorry. I hate having to tell people no. I really do. You want to be able to accommodate people. But the fact is, this is God's house. If other people want to do it, if the Presbyterian Church, the Catholic Church, the, the Mormons or whatever else is up here want to do things like that, that's up to them. They can give whatever message that they want to send to the community. But we're not worried about sending a message to the community except that you're sinners and need a savior. <laughs> and he is a wonderful savior. We're worried more about sending a message to God and a message to you. This is God's house. This is for God's use. God is holy. His word is true. He is alive. It's not a house of merchandise. It's not for sale. It's not for us to be rich, for you to make me rich, for me to make you rich, or for us to make the community rich or the poor people in Africa rich. It's for us to follow God. It's his father's house. But he said, he said in Matthew 21, that they turned the temple into a den of thieves. A den of thieves. And folks, here's the sad truth. Those that seek to make money off of God's work are nothing but thieves. I don't care how well they dress, how shiny their hair is, or how little they, uh, hair they have. How well-spoken or poor-spoken they may be. Doesn't matter how big or small the work is or how long it's been in existence. Those that seek to make money off of God's work are nothing but thieves. And our world is rife with those individuals. And we're used to having thieves in our midst. They're promoted. They're encouraged. They're pandered to. They even thrive off their own thievery. But such things are not okay with the God of heaven. There will come a day of reckoning for all of us. You say, well, what can I do about it? Just guard it from your own life. Guard it from your own life. Someone comes into the area, don't be like groupies that follow after them. Oh, so-and-so is here. And, but they're just about themselves. We live in a day where we're used to having thieves in our midst. It's accepted. 
We live in a country where the country is all about the money. At its core, capitalism is really all about the money, isn't it? And really, in our country, as long as you have money, you and I both know this, there's not a thing we can do to fix it except live for Jesus ourselves and preach the gospel. But we know this, as long as you have money, you can get anything swept under the rug, can't you? Churches know this. They act the same way. We've seen it over the years. It doesn't please Christ. Not one bit. The ministry is to be the ministry. God's work is to be God's work. It's not about making money. It's about following Christ. Christ's zeal. And then we see, lastly, God's expectations. Well, if not a place of business, what should God's house be? Well, God tells us. He tells us at least fourfold what his house is to be used for. We see it in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 that God's house, this is his expectations. You say, well, why doesn't God manhandle and make everybody do what's right? That's not how he works and that's not how he has worked over history. God does what he wants, when he wants, as he sees fit. But no, in the end, there is a day of reckoning for all. There is reckoning for pastors, a special reckoning the Bible puts forth, or seems to put forth. There is a reckoning for all believers of what you did with your salvation. What you did with what God has given you. There is a reckoning for fathers, for mothers, for children. We all have our stations. <laughs> we all have our accountability. There will be a day of judgment. The Bible is very clear of that. So what should God's house be used for? Second Chronicles 7 and verse number 11 says Solomon. No, it did not. It says, thus Solomon Finish the house of the Lord and the king's house, and all that came into Solomon's heart to make it the house of the Lord, and in his own house he prosperously effected. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer, and have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. God's house, what was it to be used for in Jesus' day? A house of sacrifice. What's it to be used for today? A house of sacrifice, not bulls and goats but spiritual sacrifices. Psalms, the Psalms are very clear that God loves the sacrifices of righteousness. A broken and contrite heart. People that will humble themselves before him and lay down their lives, saying, here is my life. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. That's laying down your life. That's what God's looking for day in and day out, especially when we come to church, a house of sacrifice. God, I've never heard this before, but it's your word. It's clearly your word. And so help me to do it. Please help me to do it. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to the house of sacrifice. God goes on to talk to Solomon and says, if I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. A house of sacrifice, a place of repentance, a place where we get right with God and determine to walk with God. Him. God doesn't expect that of the world. He expects it of us. We're to be a people that work, as uh, I read in Ephesians 5, and is all through the scriptures, really, is we have to work at humility, work at humility, work at humility. And it does take work. Every Sunday and every Wednesday, if no other day we hit the reset button on, our, on ourselves and say, 
I want to follow Christ. Help me to follow you, Jesus. A house of sacrifice. Number two, it's to be a house of prayer. House of prayer. Isaiah 56 and verse number seven. And Jesus even said this when he cleansed the temple, the latter part of his ministry. That his father's house was to be a house of prayer, but they made it to be a den of thieves. Isaiah 56, verse number seven says, Even them I will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. My house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar, for mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. Prayer where we can commune with the God of heaven. Prayer where we can pray for ourselves and we can pray corporately as a body of believers. Prayer where we pray to God, we send our needs to him. We know that he hears because we are his children. He cares because we are his sheep and he will take care of us as we follow him. Then we have number three, a house of instruction. A house of instruction. The church is to be not an entertainment center, not a house of politics, not a house where business is conducted as far as making money, but it's to be a school. It's to be a house of instruction, a place that we say, I'm going to church. Well, what does that mean? Well, I'm going to learn about God and his word. I'm going to surrender my heart afresh to Christ. I'm going to pray to the God of heaven. I'm going to fellowship with God's people. House of instruction, Ecclesiastes 5 and verse 1 says, Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God. It means be careful, watch yourself, and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. The sacrifice of fools is that they do not consider what's being said they're either apathetic or they make an emotional decision because that's what's being appealed for. Oh, yeah, I'll do that. And then it's not done because it's not put here. It's akin to the person, as Jesus said, the father told the son, go and do this. Okay, dad, I'll go do it. Then he didn't. But the better son said, no, Dad, I'm not going to do that. But then he did it. We need to be a people of consideration, a thinking people. Not a people like this world once where you just plug the computer into your head or the TV or the songs and it just feeds your brain and you just absorb information and get indoctrinated by it and don't think about it at all but a people that when we study, we consider. When we hear the word, we consider. We think. We don't offer the sacrifice of fools. Let be not rash with thy mouth, the word says, and let not thine heart be hasty to honor anything before God. For God is in heaven and thou upon the earth, therefore let thy words be few. Consider. Consider. Learn. Isaiah chapter 2 and verse number 3, we have another along these lines. Isaiah 2 and verse number 3, where the Bible says, And many people shall go up, and this is during the millennial reign when the capital of the earth is Jerusalem. But many people shall go and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways. And we will walk in his paths. There will be understanding that the house of God, 
the temple in Jerusalem where Jesus himself will abide, that there won't be the nonsense that happens in so many houses of God, so-called, today. But people will go with a determination, with a hunger and thirst to learn so that they can be like him. That's why we have church, or why we're supposed to. He will teach us, and we will walk in his paths. I may be the one speaking here, and me and my wife may be the ones that teach, but what are we to teach? His ways. Not my opinion, but Christ's truth. And we will walk in his paths, not my path, not my wife's path, Christ's path. We follow after him, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And then we have Micah 4.2 also, which speaks of similar things. Number four, number four, God's expectation for his house is to be a house of meeting. A house of meeting, a place where God's people gather together, but not just gather together, but do so in unity. We looked at Ephesians 5 in Sunday school and how in order to have unity, there must be humility. If there's not humility, you can't have unity. That's what Ephesians 5 also speaks of when it says submit yourselves one to another. There must be humility. We must have each other's best interests at heart. We must be seeking truth and light together. As long as those things happen, there can be and will be unity. But if those things do not happen, if pride reigns in one or both or all parties, then it's just a free-for-all, and that's what you have in most places today. That's why people don't want to go to church. It's just strife. It's burdensome. It is a weight upon your shoulders to, as as a pastor, me personally, maybe as a parishioner, you yourself too, it is for me personally burdensome to stand here and look in the often dead eyes of others watching or the smirking faces of others not smirking jovially but smirking pridefully or whatever else and knowing knowing that you're not in unity as a church and that there's nothing you can do about it You pray to God, and you cry out to God, and you trust God that he knows what he's doing. There, there's no wonder people don't want to go to church because it's just a free-for-all. It's just, well, Joe's upset with me, or Jane's upset with her, or him, or there's just all manner of things going on that are ungodly enough for the Lord. No, it's to be a place where God's people gather together in unity. But unity of what? The pastor's opinions or somebody's politics or somebody's feel-good self-help, you know. Unity of what? Unity that we all like, the University of Alabama? I know we don't. This is a what if. University or a, a unity of, it could be unity of all things. I saw today someone said, oh, the fellowship of the gospel, the unity of the gospel. No, there's plenty of people that get the gospel right. That even preach the gospel but aren't saved. It's got to be unity of the whole counsel of God. Unity, as 2 John says, of Christ's doctrine. A love for truth and light. Not just a small portion of it. And then we can do whatever else. No, a unity of the whole thing put in proper perspective, interpreted properly. House of meeting, Psalm 26 and verse number 8, the Bible says, Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house and the place where thine honor dwelleth. 
Psalm 27 and verse number 4 says, One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. And then Psalm 122 and verse number 1. I've got to flip back there quickly. Psalm 122 and verse number one. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. Help. What's that? 122, sorry. Uh, yeah, I was thinking about this verse and wondering why it wasn't in there. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. That makes a whole lot more sense, doesn't it, when you get the right verse. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. It's a house of meeting, a place where we come. Why? Well, I feel like I need to. Well, why, why here? Why come here? Why these people? Why us, right? Well, I don't know. That's why I've always done. I hope it's so much more than that. <laughs> because <laughs> Matthew's playing a concert for us. <laughs> a place where we can laugh when the cell phone goes off. <laughs> And mine has done it too. I remember vividly the day the Avengers theme went off in the sound booth. But yeah. It's to be a family, is it not? A place where we can have things like that happen and we can laugh and not laugh in scorn, laugh mockingly, but laugh because it's funny. <laughs> and we're people like Matthew knows he's not being made fun of, he's not being mocked, right? That's a family. I know there's toxic families out there. I'm very familiar with that. But a good family appreciates each other, right? Has fun together at times. Keeps the serious things serious and the happy things happy, the joyous things joyous. The sad things we mourn together, that's a family, isn't it? We help each other with what help is needed as we are able. It's an organism, not an organization. An organization is where you have the leaders that are above everybody else. We told Phoebe this. I know Pensacola does it too. Bob Jones does it. Every college does it. In their chapels, they got their little, a lot of churches do. I mean, we, we got it here. But people sit up on the platform. They're above everyone else. And there's a reason for that. It's because somewhere in here, they're thinking, I'm above you. I'm better than you. You say, oh, so-and-so would never do that or say that. Then have so-and-so sit down amongst the people once in a while and see what happens. See if they'd be willing to do that. Or if they get mad and say, no, my place is up there, then that's a Pharisee. <laughs> it's the truth of our day. It's an organization, people that think they're better than other people, people that will not lower themselves to come to the hospital, will not lower themselves to come to your house. And you say, well, that's not lowering. It's a mentality, folks. It's not really lowering. But it is to them, it's a mentality. It's to be an organism where we're all sinners saved by grace. The pastor does his job just because there needs to be a pastor that does the pastor's job. The pastor's wife does her job because that's what God wants her to do. The pianist does their job because that's what God wants them to do. People clean the church because that's what God wants us to do. People are in the nursery, teach Sunday school. We do what we do, not because we're better or worse, but because it's what God wants us to do. It's what people do in a family. We do what needs done. We help each other do it, right? Because it needs to be done. Because we love one another. 
that's not organization. Organizations, I know I've worked for U.S. Cellular, I've worked for Comcast, and I've worked for a plethora of other places throughout my life. And all these organizations say, oh, we're just one big family. They don't act that way, do they? Ace comes the closest I've seen, honestly. Maybe Pruitt's does too, I don't know. But Ace for sure, because Phoebe, we're very accustomed to what goes on there. But it's still an organization. They're focused on making money. That's not to be our focus. The church is to be a family, not a business. It's to be a people that focus on learning about and following Christ together. Not people that focus on filling pews to make people rich and famous in God's name. It takes work to do all that. It takes you and me determining, yeah, God's house is going to stay a house of sacrifice, a house of prayer, a house of instruction, a house of meeting. It's not the community's little play place. I know that's against the party line today, but the church is not the community's little play place that they can come and rent, that they can come and occupy, they can come and do whatever. It's God's house. It's for God's people to learn God's word together and to, yes, help individuals at times as it's appropriate. But it's to be these four things, especially sacrifice, prayer, instruction, meeting, an organism where we learn to go out and be better for Christ, be testimonies for Christ, promote Christ in the community this week. It was out of Christ's goodness that he purged that temple. He had the ability, right, and love for truth to do it. Have you ever had a time where you saw sin, became angry, but could do nothing about it? That's what we're talking about today. There's very few times where we can do something about it because of the various stations that we have in life. I can't fix people's homes. I can't fix other churches. I can't fix the government, right? I can fix my own family. <laughs> I can fix some things in the church as the pastor. But by and large, we're limit we had to tell Phoebe this week, Phoebe, you're not the manager of ACE. You can't fix this. I'm sure Sarah sees things and, and Heather sees things and they're like, why won't they fix this? It's <laughs> we all get that. And unless we're in management or super, it's not our job. All we can do is, we told Phoebe, if it hinders your job, then you go to the management. But really, it's all you can do. But yeah, that spiritual gift manifesting itself. When you see sin, you get mad. And you can't do anything about it. That's that spiritual gift manifesting itself. Sometimes we can fix things and should. But so many other times we're restrained because we're under some authority. We have to trust in God to make it right. We'll continue on on Wednesday. Lord, we thank you for this time. We pray you'd help us to be a people that love truth and light. Help us to be a people that keep ourselves pure for your glory and keep this church as a building, as a ministry, and what have you, pure for your glory. Help us, we pray. Well, thank you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. With heads bowed and eyes closed, Sarah's going to come and play.